We've got to stop meeting like this, Gwillem. We've really got to stop meeting like this. I love it. That's what I look forward to. I don't mean we've got to stop meeting. I mean we've got to stop meeting like this. I kind of I want to meet you in the real world. I want to oh. meet you in person again. You say that. Yeah. I, do you know what? With a mix of long COVID smell loss plus complete lack of sensitivity as to the use of deodorant, having not worked with other people for a while, you do not want to work with me. And I think, I think it's going to be a smelly place for a while till people remember. Well, do you know, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was wondering what going back, to, we, we were talking about this kind of normal and new normal and stuff like that. I don't think the world's ever going to work again. I can't, I can't imagine doing stuff like this in the same room as you. It just wouldn't work, would it? No, absolutely not. Not with those curtains, Lee. <laughs> you leave my curtains out of this. <laughs> anyway, do you want a little tortoise update? Tortoise CCTV, please. Yeah, okay. So it was a good job I had him on the CCTV because we've got this CCTV thing. Now, I can't even say CCTV. But you can watch it on your phone. And I was watching it on the phone from the comfort of my living room. And I watched him. I watched him climb up onto the patio higher than any tortoise should be able to climb. That was that's fine. The one, the one you built out of Semtex. The one I built with about five, yeah, five and a half ton of Semtex. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah. And, um, and then he tried to get up onto the next level and he fell on his back. Oh. And, and he was rocking there for a bit. And I thought, that's right. Whenever he, whenever he topples over, he can normally write himself. And I forgot. And I remembered about an hour later to check in on him. And there, the poor bugger was still on his back, just sort of like rocking to and fro. So I had to run out and rescue him. I might have left it a little bit too long. He might, it might have been a bit too stressful for his sort of internal systems because he had, a, uh, had the odd accident or two upside down, which wasn't very pleasant to clean up. Oh, that's the worst. No, never, never do that when you're doing a handstand. Same thing. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That's a, that's a big bit of learning there, actually, mate. I'll try and remember that. Not that I've been able to do a handstand since I was about four. It's never too late to get it back. Lee Davis and Gwilym Roberts are the two IPs in a pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property, brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorney. We're going to revisit one of your favourite topics today, so I'm going to have to rely on you to drive at times, mate, because you are my expert when it comes to this one. We're going to take another foray into the scary world of artificial intelligence, this time in the company of Professor Ryan Abbott. Welcome to the podcast, Ryan. Thank you. I, it occurred to me we could all do handstands, but I'm not sure on Zoom uh, we're appropriately dressed. Now, or even on a podcast when it's only um, sound. It's, aud- it's audio. We are. We're all doing handstands, everyone. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm doing a handstand, and I'm very professionally dressed from the waist down. <laughs> Ryan, you've got far too many letters after your name and far too many titles for me to do you justice. So why don't you introduce yourself, sir? Well, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I'm really excited. And I am a law professor at the University of Surrey. I'm a physician scientist by training. And these days I talk about AI because robots are sexy. They're also reasonable because I've got here your excellent book, Ryan. Well, you see, you were waving the book around, which I was very impressed by. But, you know, it wasn't as impressive as the one arm handstand everyone could see. But (laughs) let the record reflect. A friend is waving uh, my book around, and, and I couldn't be more pleased. The reasonable it, it, robot, great read. It, the impressive bit is that Gwilym put fake little page dividers in there, so it looks like he's <laughs> actually read it. Mm, that was a good page. That was a good page. Yeah. I took a little look at your um, website, Ryan. I have to say I was really disappointed by the domain name, Ryan Abbott. I was expecting it to be Rybot, R-Y-B-O-T-T. I was, I was so thinking clever. you really missed the trick there. It probably only really works with an Australian accent, though, I realised when I... um. <laughs> when I try to have a little play around with it. And it tells me that you're a licensed physician, patent attorney, and acupuncturist. That's a that's a rare old combination, isn't it? You, there can't be many of you around. No, I, I think probably not. I might be the first acupuncturist, medical doctor, lawyer that I know. Well, <laughs> who have ever existed. But, you know, I, I figured if I injured someone badly enough with acupuncture, I'd probably want a law degree to, you know, facilitate resolving that and uh, accidentally found my way in med school at some point. No acupuncture jokes, Gwilym. I know you can be a right pain in the neck when it comes to those. Oh, he's good. I do have a long theory about the development of acupuncture, which I could go into because oh, okay, very quickly. Well, so whoever started off with acupuncture said, so acupuncture, you put a needle in, it stops a pain somewhere, right? So they must have tested on some poor student, hit them somewhere and stuck a needle in somewhere else and said, has it stopped hurting? That's a lot of trial and error there. Yeah, I suppose you wouldn't want to be the first person to get acupuncture. But, um, <laughs> so I suspect it's slightly more, it's a lot more sophisticated than that. But that's more or less what your associates have to deal with. <laughs> it's a good training mechanism. Yeah. Anyway, you've already mentioned the book, Gwilym, haven't you? You've waved it around for the audience, which was very kind of you. The Reasonable Robot, Artificial Intelligence and the Law. Um, I've got the Kindle version. I 
grabbed it yesterday and I've I'm, I'm had a good old read last night. Thoroughly enjoyed it. It was very generous of you to have the Chartered Institute buy a copy of the book for all of your members. <laughs> One, yeah. We're going to share it around. Ah. <laughs> it, it just struck me, and I don't know whether this is a reasonable analysis or not, but we seem to be in a place where we're spending more time arguing about AI and its application than we are finding out how it's actually going to change humanity. Take, take the whole um, AI as an inventor thing. Um, does it really matter if AI can be credited as, a, as an inventor? Uh, does AI know it's an inventor? Well, if you're looking for a response from me for that... Uh, well, you're, no, you're our expert, it'd be nice. I suppose so. I thought we were going to just stick on handstands, but um, <laughs> I, I, wouldn't even say, I wouldn't even say you're crediting the AI as an inventor because in point of fact, the AI could care less if you list it as an inventor. You know, what does this do? Well, if an AI invents, which is a loaded statement, you are informing the public that this was an invention made by AI rather than something made by a traditional human inventor, and you're keeping someone from taking credit for work they haven't done. So if I can ask one of, you know, deep minds AIs to invent 10,000 new drug compounds, if I were to say I invented all of those, it would really change the meaning of what it is to be an inventor. And I think it would discredit legitimate human ingenuity. But perhaps the more important, at least the most important commercial implication of whether or not you can name an AI as an inventor is, if you don't have a traditional human inventor for an invention, right now in several jurisdictions, including the UK, you can't have a patent. And so if you have a company that's investing in a sophisticated AI system to be used in R&D, and you can't point to a person and say that person was an inventor on this, then there is no patentable output, just perhaps a trade secret. Yeah, another another feather to your bow is the the fact that obviously you've been testing this legally recently through the and forgive the pronunciation. Is it Dabus? 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 Dabus. Dabus. Um, let's hear a bit about that because of course this is where we actually had the test. Sure. So we, you know, I am working with a group of patent attorneys internationally, and we are filing a series of test cases for two inventions made autonomously by an artificial intelligence called Dabus. One is for a beverage container based on fractal geometry, which is kind of like a snail shell, which could help with transportation and storage and grip. And one is for a flashing light that could attract attention in an emergency situation, say attention by an AI or a person. For both of these inventions, they lacked a traditional human inventor who devised the invention or exhibited inventive skills specifically with respect to the inventions. We filed these in the UK and in Europe because we didn't have to disclose inventorship. They did a preliminary examination and found them essentially to be patentable. We then corrected these and noted that these were AI generated inventions lacking a traditional human inventor. And they've now been rejected in the US, the UK, Europe, Australia, and Germany. All of these are under appeal. We have a uh, court of appeal hearing in July on this and um, a EPO board of appeal hearing in December. Uh, the EPO president has recently asked to intervene in the case, and the questions are essentially whether you can have protection for something made without a traditional human inventor, who or what would be listed as an inventor, and who would own the invention. And we are arguing that there should be protection available for this sort of thing. It's no less important to incentivize inventive behavior by a machine than a person. It results in social innovation, that the AI's owner should own any patents on its output the same way they would own trade secrets on AI output. And the patent system is designed to encourage disclosure of trade secrets. And I think that's more or less what we're arguing. It's, and as far as I can tell, a lot of, we're not really getting down into the legal argument about whether AI is capable of inventing even. It's more, law says, got to be a person. I mean, it's, it's almost formulaic, the response you're getting. Isn't that right? Well, it's interesting, you know, perhaps naively, we spent a good deal of time up front kind of doing diligence on the factual question of whether an AI is an inventor. And actually, the person who invented the AI, Dr. Thaler, has a new paper out on this that's up on our website for the project, artificialinventor.com. But no patent office has yet expressed any interest in, in the factual question, did the AI act as a sole inventor? In the US and the UK, that statement has been accepted. And in fairness, patent offices accept that statement from human inventors. I was the inventor. They don't question that unless a third party challenges it, although it does depend a bit in the jurisdiction. Um, right. But assuming that an AI can factually have functioned as a sole inventor, which is the case in our court submissions, 
then legally, you know, what does that do? And in the UK, the high court judge in the matter felt that the, under the, the way the Patent Act is currently written, because the rights have to go to the inventor first and then transfer to an assignee, that the rights could not vest in a machine and then be transferred. We argued, A, that the UK Patent Act was kind of particularly permissive to this sort of thing based on its statutory language, but also, you know, an AI is, does not have legal personality and it wouldn't make sense that it would, particularly in this context, but that there's no reason for the rights to vest in an AI and then be transferred to a person when a fruit tree produces fruit for a farmer, the title to the fruit doesn't go to the tree and then go to the farmer. It's a machine, it's a piece of property, its output is property under common law doctrines of accession or first possession. And so we argued that really um, the UK law, which allows vesting of title by otherwise by virtue of law accommodates some of these common law mechanisms. And the law says it's the actual divisor. <clears throat> so you'd think if if you, if that was if it was as simple as that you say well we can prove the ai actually devised this invention ergo but as i say because the law because the inventor has to be a human basically i guess you you stop there but am i right in thinking that the judge in the uk did have a little over to statement saying that he was open to the suggestion that ai could invent or something like that well, indeed he was. Well, and again, he was he was not disputing, though, though, of course, this was based on our assertion. It was never disputed that the AI did factually invent. You know, at the hearing, he said, you know, he was very concerned that this sort of output not, you know, be devoid of property ownership interests. He was looking, I think, for us to suggest, and we explicitly declined to do so, was to say that Dr. Thaler, who is the person who invented Dabas and owns Dabas, could be the inventor by virtue of owning the AI. Um, and, and there were essentially two reasons we, we didn't feel that was the right approach. One being that, well, a company could well have owned Dabas, in which case, well, then you would have a company inventor, which pretty clearly isn't permitted under existing law. But two is that under Yeda or similar case law, um, you know, owning an AI would not qualify one to be an actual device of an invention. Someone could own an AI and not know what problem it was solving or know what its output was or the like. And perhaps that should still entitle someone to patent ownership, but it would again be a pretty significant change of what it means to be an inventor. And to be clear, I mean, <clears throat> I don't think you're, you're not really going down the road to saying the AI is the owner. I think, you know, if you're not used to the debate, people get a bit confused between the idea of AI as inventor versus AI as owner. I mean, nobody, I don't think anyone thinks that AI should own this stuff because well, why would AI want to own things? Well, indeed, certainly we've never suggested that. And I'm not really aware of anyone credibly suggesting that. You know, part of the problem is this case for better or worse has gotten a lot of media attention and the media likes the idea of an AI owning a patent. And no matter how many times I try and explain that being an inventor and owning a patent are two different things to someone who is not a patent attorney, it, it's a tough explanation, apparently, or I'm not good at explaining things. <laughs> I'm, I'm the idiot in the room. Give it a go. Explain it to me. Being an inventor on a patent and owning a patent are two different things. Yeah, it makes sense. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you know. it, does, it does raise the question, why would AI want to invent? But that we don't, I mean, that, that comes to a consciousness level discussion, I suppose. Well, I think the question, the, you know, the answer is, an AI will invent because it is told to invent, right? An AI doesn't subjectively desire to do things. You know, on the other hand, that's not really what the patent system is designed to do, right? The patent system is designed to encourage innovation at a societal level, you know, which in large part is from providing economic incentives for research and development, you know, to companies like IBM and Siemens and Google. And so it is not the AI that we're trying to incentivize. It's the people making, using, and owning AI to be developing and using more sophisticated, inventive machines in the R&D process. And so if you can get benevolent AI to use an AI to find a cure for COVID, you know, that's the sort of behavior we want to encourage and we want to protect. I can totally agree with that. And um, lots of things bubbling in my mind. One, we had, we had that IBM lot on recently. Um, we did. We did. And we talked a little bit about the, um, their, their position on AI. I was quite surprised to hear their statement. And this is from somebody who can make policy level statements for, for IBM. The IBM, they stated they don't think AI is ready to invent yet. 
Yeah, there is a uh, there's a lot of divide on that as a factual matter. I mean, just to give some kind of counterweight to an IBM level mm -hmm. case, you know, Siemens a couple of years ago at a WIPO AI and IP conference disclosed a case study where they had an AI that made a new industrial component that they wanted to file a patent on. None of their engineers would list themselves as inventors on the patent because they said the machine did all of the inventive work and thus Siemens couldn't get a patent on it. So. You know, there is by no means a kind of consensus on this. I think regardless of the extent to which AI is autonomously inventing, the boundaries between what people are doing in joint collaborative efforts and what AI is doing has really complicated this. And I think there is a lot of risk to companies now that there didn't used to be in kind of setting clear boundaries and expectations and a lot of uncertainty about how inventive act by AI will take, you know, how, how inventive behavior involving AI will be, you know, regulated and credited. Um, but, you know, the industry is is not consolidated on a position on this yet. Yeah, that's quite surprising. Given IBM's strength in, in AI and Deep Blue, that's them, isn't it? All that kind of thing. It was a surprising statement. But again, I, 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 used, I chose the word policy carefully. I suspect there's an element of policy in that statement, anyway, which I plenty of time for. I, I, I do think the larger tech companies but he's have kind of come around to their individual positions on where they think they should be. And, you know, I could only speculate as to exactly why IBM has come to that position. So if I can, if Lee's, Lee's let me run with this one, because I've, yeah, yeah, go go I've, I've got some idiot questions to ask in a moment. Don't worry. And, and also, uh, lucky. Oh, actually, very importantly, Lee, this I've got a prop, which really isn't going to work for people listening. But Ryan, you'll be very happy to hear that I still have my Thanos glove. Um, which is uh, quite important. So for those, everyone listening, I'm now wearing a large, it's rubber, but it's a rubber. Well, yes, now, now that you've kind of peeled it back, it looks a little less impressive as a <laughs> collection of infinity stones, but oh, it lights up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So anyone, anyone listening to the podcast, there's a sci there's a patent attorney sci-fi book club, which Ryan and I are proud of, well, pretty co-founders of, I'd say, actually. And uh, it's on LinkedIn. Do join. Can I do that plug, Lee? Do you mind? I don't normally do plugs. Oh, don't do that. So, so really I'm, I'm momentarily fell asleep then, mate. Apologies. Sci-fi is awesome. Anyway, I wanted to chuck that in while I remembered. Um, as a result of which, Ryan and I have had a couple of chats about this. And, and, and also, as I say... Uh, <laughs> there, there, there's something relevant in this at the moment, is there? No, not about the glove. No, that was oh, okay. irrelevant. The glove was irrelevant. Yeah. I need to say that, you know, we, we've met over rubber gloves in the past is probably as far as I can go. But we, um, we weren't going to tell that, uh, you know, continue. <laughs> Frank can always edit that out. Yeah. So, so so in the book, you obviously go a lot further into some of the implications of you know, if we get to the point where the, the letter of the law says that AI can be an inventor and the law accepts that AI can be an inventor, et cetera, the ramifications of that. And one of the, the fascinating ones is what does that do to the definition of the skilled person? So for non-patentee people listening in, the point being that uh, the test for patentability and whether something's inventive enough, the objective baseline is whether somebody who's skilled in the art would have come up with it or not without invention. With AI, that possibly changes the picture a little bit? Well... I, firstly, I thought you said only two people listened to this podcast and they were both patent attorneys, but if I'm going to explain <laughs> it to one of the two of them, you know, if they weren't, weren't paying attention to their training, um, <clears throat> I don't know that the two are necessarily related, but I think that AI certainly does affect the, the standard of the skilled person. So if we're asking right now to get a patent, whether something would be obvious to essentially an average researcher, you know, average researchers are already in many industries augmented by AI. AI expands the scope of prior art that they can work with for their own purposes by giving them access to a superhuman amount of literature. And it also makes them more sophisticated because it allows them to use AI to do things that would have been invented before for a person like pattern recognition and big data sets may become kind of a routine or standardized activity. So I think already in some instances, the skilled person is really a skilled person using an AI. Um, you know, if we have AI as inventors, AI is clearly not kind of the mainstream way that AI is, you know, that R&D is autonomously done. But if at some point in the future, AI does become the standard way that R&D is done in some fields, then to me, that effectively replaces an average researcher. In other words, if you have, you know, a new disease like COVID, and instead of going to these, you know, huge human teams of researchers, Pfizer and GSK and Novartis just go to their AIs from IBM and Microsoft and Google. 
and say, you know, here's a disease we want to cure. What's the right antibody? And the three different AIs say, here's your antibody. Um, you know, then effectively your average researcher has become an AI. And so your skilled person is either a skilled person using an inventive machine or just an inventive machine. And it raises the bar to what would be obvious because those machines will be more sophisticated than people will be. And then that, if that wasn't interesting enough, and it is, Lee, just in case you're wondering. Yeah, I'm, I'm hooked, I'm hooked. It gets even more interesting. So, um, cause uh, uh, I, the other things you covered off, uh, I've read up, I read up on, I loved it, was you don't look just look at IP. And some of these ramifications are really relevant in unrelated areas of law, but for the same sort of reason. If, and I think I've got this right. Really, really good one, I thought, was talking about um, driver liability with uh, autonomous cars. And I think you can probably explain it better than I can, the kind of how the, the parallel situation and what could, what could develop. Well, essentially, kind of the book is looking at this phenomenon where AI is doing human-like things, like being used to make new music or invent things or drive a car. So you could, you know, in a few years, use an Uber app and choose between a human-driven car and a self-driving Tesla. And yet, even though functionally people in AI are behaving the same sort of ways, the law often treats those activities very different depending on the nature of the actor. So for example, Pfizer could go to its AI to invent something or a human team to invent something, but right now Pfizer could only get a patent on one of those things. You know, similarly, if you have a self-driving car and a human-driven car cause the same accident, two different liability standards apply to those. You know, in the case of the person running someone else over, we have a negligence standard. Would a reasonable person have done that? And in the case of a self-driving car, we have a strict product liability standard asking about defects in the product and then causation. Perhaps it's, again, not such a good legal system to have two different standards of liability for exactly the same behavior because it inserts some perverse incentives about favoring one over the other. And if you're a pedestrian, you kind of don't care if you're going to get run over by a self-driving car or a person. You just really don't want to be run over. Mm -hmm. And holding the two to the same standard would make it a more level playing field to adopt whatever technology performs better on whatever metric the law is looking at, whether that's what's better at innovating, what's better at not running people over, what's better at generating economic value and tax revenue. One of the interests, so what I suggest in the book, in the case of torts, is that we should have a uniform standard. Everyone, you know, what is the reasonable standard of care? Whatever actor is setting that, whether it's an AI or a person, do you fall beneath that standard, yes or no? And what's probably going to be most interesting from that is in 20 years, when self driving cars are practical to use and essentially never run someone over. If those are setting the standard of care, then any accident a person causes would be negligent by relation to a reasonable robot, if we want to go with the sexy version of that standard. And in a sense, that would make it harder for us to drive, or at least we would internalize the cost of accidents on ourselves. You know, But right now, if you have someone who has below average driving skill, like they have severe anxiety or poor vision, we don't cut them slack. You know, It would be unfair to people they would injure. So... I think it's a better standard because it doesn't prevent people from driving the way Elon Musk wants to do. But uh, it does say, look, if you're going to choose to drive instead of using AI that would do the same thing, but much more safely, you're going to be responsible for accidents you cause. So, so Gw Gwilym's nicked one of my um, daft questions I was going to ask. So um, cheers for that, mate. That's, that's one of my questions gone. It wasn't Gw daft. Yeah, no, no, but it was the way I was going to ask it. So, <laughs> so, so I'll ask it anyway. I was, think, I was thinking about this last night because um, it's been in the news this week that there'll be a change in the UK law so that by the end of this year, we can have self-driving cars in the UK, but only those that, and I'll, I'll probably get this wrong, it's the automated lane keeping system, ALCS, which in my head feels like you're driving digital bumper cars or something like that. So they're just kind of trying to not bump into one another as long as they're following a lane. And it got me thinking about the the liability thing. So take, take knocking pedestrians out of this. I remember when I had just learned to drive, uh, being involved in my first accident, which involved someone coming into my lane, someone coming into my lane, their fault, yeah. knocking, the first knocking, event. Knocking, knocking me, moving out of that lane again, and then the insurance companies arguing about whose fault it was. And his argument was, well, I, I had recently qualified as a driver, so it must have been my fault. My argument was, 
this is the first time this has happened to me. I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> um, and, and the insurance companies just simply decided knock for knock, which was a phrase I remember hearing quite a lot in the kind of 70s and the 80s, which is we can't decide whose fault it is. We're, we're paid for yours. Here, pay for his. We're share liability. Is that is that where this ends up? Is it just kind of like knock for knock? You'll, you'll have these bumps and we just decide that it can't be sorted out. That was my daft question. Yeah, Lee, there's a lot to unpack there, starting with the fact that I think both of you had essentially terrible arguments about liability. But <laughs> one of the nice things I think we'll have here with AI is that you're not going to have this situation because it's going to be a lot easier to tell what happened. So, you know, there was recently an, another potential fatality. Well, there was a fatality involving self-driving software, but kind of the most famous fatality was this one in 2018 in, in Arizona with the self-driving Uber where an Uber hit a pedestrian who was crossing the street at night. There was a safety driver behind the wheel who was watching a game show on her phone um, and is being criminally prosecuted for that. But in any case, you know, the car failed to detect a pedestrian and, and collided with them. Now, if you had a human doing something like that late at night colliding with a pedestrian, it would be very difficult to tell what happened. You know, with a self-driving car, we know exactly what happened because there is a tremendous amount of data around it. And as much as people complain or worry about transparency and explainability with AI, I think it will often be the case that AI is far more transparent and explainable than a person is and a lot less self-motivated to lie about it. So in, in when the car of the future fails to keep you in your lane, you're going to know what happened. Now, one of the interesting things about kind of what I propose having a negligence framework instead of a circle liability framework is with negligence, we don't worry so much about why someone did something or why an AI did something. I think it may be very difficult to say, well, why did the AI drift out of its lane, right? Though that will be important for the engineers on the back end to fix it. But it's far more simple to say, did the AI drift out of its lane and collide with an adjacent car? If yes, that was negligent, end of story. We don't have to have a team of computer scientists trying to figure out how this thing operates and whether there was a defect in it. Yeah, gotcha. Makes sense. Can I um can I go off on a bit of a tangent? Is that right now, Gwilym? We we can we can come back to the kind of hard IP stuff, but uh, because I did have a little dabble in the book last night, I got I got to thinking about all sorts of things. I know I know that you've got an interest in the future of work. I'm a an amateur dabbling in the future of work. I, I do a little bit of talking around the under professional association space. So um so I talk to other professions about the future of work in a very limited amateurish way. But I I've developed this view in, in terms of speaking to other professions. I've developed quite a hard view. And that's that most professions in the UK are sleepwalking into the future, particularly around AI and other disruptive tech. They seem they seem to accept that AI is going to disrupt, it's going to take over physical work, but they don't seem to accept. I had a long conversation with the Law Society around this one about the commoditization of um, legal services. They don't seem to accept that it's going to take over in any way, shape or form thinking stuff. And I know I briefed you a wee bit on this when we did the briefing session yesterday, uh, Ryan, but I just go over it for Gwillem's benefit. We did the SEPA debate about five years ago on, on AI. And to cut a very long story short, our public debate concluded that it was inevitable that a patent would be drafted and granted without human intervention. But there was a caveat, and that caveat was that it wouldn't be a very good one. That, you know, the moment that AI starts to do the thinking bit, it won't do it very well. So in summary, and this is just for you to respond to, AI cannot possibly draft or examine patent claims as well as humans. That was where we got to. Well, I mean, I have a couple of thoughts to share on that. Unless you were waiting for Gwillem's profound insight, he's just kind of playing with the Thanos. Oh, I've, I've, we've, been, no, we've, been, we've been doing this for a year now. I've given up. I'm just, oh, playing, right. with my goal. I'm just playing with my goal. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, don't, don't let me interrupt that. AI can already draft a patent application from scratch. Right? There is, for example, a company called Specifio, where if you enter a claim, it will draft an entire patent for you. Now, Specifio says you're not supposed to then file that patent. That's an aid to assist a patent lawyer. You know, the idea being that now instead of taking 10 hours to draft the application, you've already got an application, so it takes you five hours. Plus, it includes a lot of kind of best language around these things. But, you know, we could have taken a sentence gotten from Davis, right, instead of us as the patent lawyers kind of drafting the application, put it into Specifio. In fact, if I had been aware of a Specifio in 2018, um, I would probably would have done this, you know, because it would have made the whole thing more interesting and just filed that application. So we are already at the point where you can take a person out of this equation. 
I agree with them that AI is not at the stage where it does a better job than a, a per member of your institute, but you know, we've come a long way very quickly. And even if, even right now, if that sort of technology was being widely adopted, it would be replacing a number of attorneys because it would streamline the drafting process and you would have less need of kind of junior people working on initial drafts of patent applications, you know, the same way that large law firms are using AI to streamline and simplify diligence on mergers and acquisitions and cutting out some of the bottom of the pyramid. You know, the people who kind of learn what to do from sitting but at a isn't, but isn't, isn't the danger in that? And this was the conversation I had with the then chief exec of the law society. Isn't the danger there is that you by taking the grunt work out, the grunt work is where new young professionals cut their teeth. So, so you need to think about another way of growing and evolving the profession because you're commoditizing or you're automating the stuff where traditionally you let people make mistakes and you let people learn. Right. Well, I think that, well, what to do about that's a separate question, but I agree if we are, for the kind of senior people who have a lot of experience and are thinking at a high level, AI is, I think, nowhere near kind of taking over the sorts of things that they do. But you're right, clients aren't going to want to pay to have your junior people learn how to make mistakes on grunt work when you can have an AI do a much cheaper, faster, more efficient job of that sort of thing. And that does cut out training opportunities from young people. You know, one option is to have firms kind of make conscious decisions to be training junior people in ways that allow them to become more senior effective members, even if that isn't a cost you can offload onto clients quite as well. For firms that are less open-minded than that, um, I think it's going to be a problem as AI starts kind of chipping away at, you know, entry-level sorts of work. I, I just want one more before maybe I hand back to, to Gwilym, and it's, a, it's an extension of that. I, I replayed part of the CEPA debate. I've got some notes. So I just read back over some notes from five years ago. And another view that was expressed in that debate was that um, even if AI does reach this level where it can do the thinking work um, to the level or beyond the equivalent human, we would simply legislate against it. We would stop it by legislation. Um, and I, I know you've touched on it already, but in terms of the law with respect to AI and the world of work, is it running ahead or lagging behind? Well, I, I think a protectionist measure like legislating against use of AI would be a bad idea. Um, you know, A, because we're in, you know, a global market, although I suppose if you really wanted to have a protectionist measure for domestic UK legal filings, I suppose that the UK state could do that and effectively prevent people from using AI. But, you know, what you're doing there is essentially just punishing clients and law firms that are more innovative and effective and making clients pay more as a protectionist measure. I mean, for example, there are a variety of, you know, medical device and software companies that claim they have AI that can outperform physicians at certain narrow medical tasks. For example, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the U.S. last year approved reimbursement for an AI that could autonomously diagnose someone as having uh, macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. So instead of going to see a physician, a primary care doctor, and having that diagnosis, you just look in a machine and the machine diagnoses you. And it does a more effective job than a general practitioner would. Let's say that sort of thing can automate a lot of what NHS providers are doing, although it couldn't entirely replace one, you know, and we'd say, oh, we want to save jobs for doctors. Let's not use that sort of thing. But all you're doing is then introducing more cost and giving patients a less effective means of getting their health care treated. You know, I, I don't think that's any kind of solution that benefits society or really anyone. If an AI can do something significantly better than a person, we should be working on finding areas where people can make more valuable social contributions. And it's going to be a long time until there is nowhere people can do that. But even if there was a general artificial intelligence that could outperform really anyone at anything, you know, that would just mean we as a society had an unlimited amount of wealth and, you know, we wouldn't have to work to be productive and Willem could have an unlimited number of infinity gauntlets. Infinite number. Indeed. Perfect. I should get, so, I mean, I have totally agree that yeah legislating against progress is not traditionally been very successful i think many governments have tried it and um I'm not going to go anywhere into great deal about the patent profession but we're seeing a little bit of that going on in certain areas of the ip profession right now but anyway that's it's a cheeky one um 
but yeah. where I think you know we're not really going into the the, the bigger ethics of AI or anything in detail, but there are safeguards that do need to be built into to AI, and I think there's some that's a whole there's a massive debate about how to make sure that if you are going to have a, an AI that eventually makes very important decisions, how to build in morality, given that we haven't really worked it out for ourselves. Well, in, indeed. Well, and to be clear, there's a difference against kind of protectionist measures and you know appropriate governance frameworks it's for AI. Right. You know. You wouldn't want to ban self-driving cars to allow taxi drivers to have work. You know, on the other hand, we shouldn't just like let anyone self-driving car on the road however we want it now because that would be just preposterously unsafe. Well, you know, the legal profession is not a, a big advocate of change. One of the the nice bits, if or one of the silver linings of the COVID-19 pandemic has been that we have been forced into the future and figured out that actually some of these things work just fine. You know, if you had wanted to have a deposition with someone remotely in another country a year and a half ago, it just wouldn't have happened. And now everyone's realized, actually, why weren't we doing this a year and a half ago? Who knows what things will come to rest on? But, you know, sometimes the legal profession needs a little nudge. And I think there is a lot more that legal tech could be doing than it is right now. That was profound. I'm glad you remembered it. It's got quiet. I meant it. You, you, you have that yeah. effect, Gwilym, don't you? You say something, it just kills a conversation every time. Well, every you time. know, when the when the arguably leading patent attorney in, in the EU is saying that I said something profound, you know, I had to take a step back and a deep breath, but, you know, I've recovered now. There, there, there's no argument about it. It tells you that he is on his website. Well, it, well, it says arguably on his website. I know. I had that, yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of argument. He, he, he won't take me up on it, but I always tell Gwilym that it should... He should always open on his website with "If Carlsberg made patent attorneys." That's <laughs> that's how he should describe himself. I was actually this neatly drags it back to patents, actually, which which I wanted to do. Go back to that point you raised, Lee, about the previous heap of debate about whether AI, yes, AI can make patents, but not good or bad, not good patents. I mean, I always thought that's a very interesting point because there's no legal def definition of a good patent or a bad patent. There's just a definition of a valid patent and an invalid patent. But turning it around, actually, it occurred to me that our inventive step test effectively is looking for whether you were showing some sort of human ingenuity over the normal. And so I think it's an interesting reflection that if we've got to a point where AI is able to invent something that passes the obviousness test, in a sense, that's kind of a Turing test in itself. It is already meeting an objectively set indication of enhanced human activity, if you will. So we were not only, I mean, sorry, me answering the question is it's Ryan's podcast, but hey, um, <laughs> it's a team effort. It's a team effort. Yeah, it's a team effort. a tortoise, a glove, some handstands, it's all happening. So already, you know, we, we're seeing AI meeting basic tests of, of inventiveness already. And this is just the beginning. It's a long way to go, surely. Well, in, indeed. You know, I think this comes to the two sorts of ways you could look at and think about AI. And I think the right approach, certainly from a legal and a regulatory perspective, is to look at behavior rather than intrinsically what is going on with an AI. So, you know, again, as you point out, if an AI is behaving the same way as a person, you know, that really was the focus of the Turing test. Alan Turing, who said, can a machine think? Firstly, we don't know what it means when a person thinks. So how could we possibly decide if an AI is thinking? And secondly, who cares at all? It, it's really about how people behave. So could an AI behave indistinguishably from a person? You know, that should be the test of whether a machine is intelligent. And, and I tend to agree with that. AI has kind of over the years picked up little bits of what makes a person intelligent. So people thought, well, an AI could never play chess as well as a person. That would require some crazy cognitive abilities. And geez, we'd be living in the future if that happens. And then AI on my phone could dominate any human player ever. But suddenly that's no longer so intelligent now that a machine has conquered that. You know, well, that's that, you know, that doesn't count. But an AI could never make a piece of music someone would want to listen to. And now you can go to OpenAI's jukebox and hear it sounds like Katy Perry has made music from an AI or there's new uh, Nirvana music from an AI. It's not that great, but it's not that bad. Well, you know, that's something else. AI is inventing things. Ah, that's something else. We'll, we'll keep the little sliver up until it's, it's no longer anything meaningful, but it will remain human. So what it got me thinking, actually, what is the law on... Either of you can answer this because Gwilym's a lawyer as well. What's <laughs> alleged, uh, allegedly? Um, what's what's the law on arguably? Take, arguably, sorry, that's the word. Arguably. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> let's let's take art 
painting, whatever, music, literature. What, what, where is the law if that stuff is created by AI? So if, if AI writes a really fascinating crime novel, you know, who owns that? Well, this is very similar to the patent test case we're doing. But the UK was actually the world's leader in this area in 1988. They wrote the first law to allow protection for that sort of output. It's called the computer generated work. And where you lack a traditional human author, the producer of the work, as in the person who undertakes to have the work created, is legally deemed to be the author. And it gets a shortened period of protection. So that's a good system if AI, which has been writing books for decades, but they've been awful. <laughs> if, if AI gets to the point where, you know, it's making stuff people actually want to pay to read, you know, and we like the fact we're getting creative output from AI, well, this encourages companies to make and build and use that sort of AI, which I think is the right outcome. Now, the UK is an outlier with this law. In the US, they've gone the opposite direction. They don't have a law, but they have a copyright office policy that says only things that come from the mind of an author can be protected. Machines have no minds. And therefore, if you have an AI that makes that writes the next Harry Potter version, or if that's out of favor right now, the next Game of Thrones book, or if George Martin dies and we we need that AI to finish the series, right? You can't protect that sort of thing in the US. And there was a case a few years ago that almost challenged this, that was the monkey selfies case. And that involved a picture that a monkey, a series of pictures a monkey took of itself and people were fighting to commercialize that. And the copyright office said, no, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals sued on behalf of the monkey, alleging it owned the copyright. But that was dismissed in, a, in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals not challenging the policy, though, but challenging that a monkey under U.S. law isn't generally allowed to sue. So they toss it out on standing. But while I think as a major economic matter, kind of AI-generated inventions are a little ways off from kind of having a substantial impact, AI-generated copyrightable works are going to be a big issue in this next decade because technologies like GPT-3, AI has gotten a lot better in the past five years at making stuff people want to interact with. And once it gets good enough to do that stuff, the marginal cost of making more output is almost nothing. So an AI could make an almost unlimited amount of work at a certain level once it gets there. And once, I mean, the, the, the difference between the copyright approach and the patent approach, at least here, does kind of demonstrate the risk of going off going off policy, if you like, in terms of, again, what you said before, what the patent system is for. Because if you get to a situation where in a patent world, you've got an invention, but because you can't point to a human inventor, you don't patent it, you probably also don't put it into the public domain. And you're breaking half the, half the point of the system, which is to get a monopoly, but to add to the stock of human knowledge. So the issue, I mean, for me, the issue is, unfortunately, we've got a dodgy statute, uh, and they're quite tricky. They take a while to change. Uh, but maybe we should start lobbying, Lee. Maybe we should get onto this. Can I, can I pick up just a couple of other things? And we've, we've touched on them on the podcast, because I, I, I only had the chance to skim read stuff last night. So um, one of the things that I was fascinated on, because I'd really not thought about it, was your take on taxation. And um, I'm never, ever going to have a conversation with a chatbot in the same way again. Uh, not, normally I try to trick them. I never manage to. But now I'm going to see them as this thing that's robbing the economy of income. And I, I didn't, didn't ever see that I would do that. I've, I've not even really got a question here. I'm just talking a load of rubbish, aren't I, really? Um, it, did, it did get me thinking, though, that in the conversation we're having about driverless cars and the conversation we're having about chat, chat bots, there's got to be a marriage in there somewhere. Because the one, the one benefit of being in a car with a driver in it in London is that you've at least got another human to talk to. And I hope we're not going to lose that with driverless cars. So we need a chat. We need a chatbot in there somewhere. We, there's a risk. There's a possibility of not having to talk to drivers in London. Isn't that one of the greatest advances in humanity? That's awesome. It, it also struck me, and I'm only saying this now for the comedic effect. Obviously, is <laughs> comedians, and they, and they need to remain nameless because otherwise, I'm obviously could be subject to some kind of um, defamation action here. This would be a fantastic new tax loophole for them, wouldn't it? All they would have to do would be to create themselves in AI, and then the AI goes in and does the gigs, and they're never paying tax. You know, I think that disclosure is enough if we hold off on this podcast for a few days for Gulam to file an application for this. Um, <laughs> can, so can, we get Dabbas, can we get Dabbas to file the application? That'd be save us all some time. Well, Dabbas could reduce it to practice. We can use the program that will that will make the patent application. So we really wouldn't need that much time at all, really just an hour, I think. Should yeah. get the, uh, <laughs> what's, um, that, what's that going to cost me? 
<laughs> oh well, we'll talk about that offline. But 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 yes, to marry these things, it is it is interesting and something that a lot of people don't think about. So when Gwillem's firm replaces their associates with this AI that can auto draft patent applications, let's say that the AI does an equivalent job to a person. And you know, there's a lot of moving pieces in that. But let's say the company looks at it and says, you know, at the end of the day, we're paying the same amount, we're getting the same level of productivity. These things are kind of interchangeable. Which way do we go? Well, we're right now encouraging the firm through tax policy to automate because they don't have to make national insurance contributions for work done by an AI. So that's probably, again, if we're trying to have a level playing field, if we're wanting to select for whatever behavior is more efficient and not produce perverse incentives into that equation, that's really not a good system. And worse, the more AI and people are able to do the same sorts of things. On top of that, because most tax revenue comes in one way, shape, or form from wage-based incomes, either from income taxes or from national insurance contributions, and a relatively small amount comes from capital taxes and corporate taxes, Kilburn's decision to automate reduces tax revenue for the state, which is problematic because you know the state will be need to paying those unemployed associates to find a new sort of thing to do or keep the meeting. So I think the solution to this, again, is to have a, a system that is more neutral to AI and human behavior by, for example, reducing taxes that are human-centric and by you know having a tax base that is more broadly based on capital than labor income. And another benefit of that is as a few people like Jeff Bezos and Gwillem are really the primary beneficiaries of all this AI wealth, this would be a, a, a mechanism of having a bit more distributional fairness in you know, society's benefits from AI. I'm going to let take, him come I'll, back. I'm, I'm waiting for him to come back on that one. So. I'll take it. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. No, I think it's actually, we tend to, one tends to look at it from such an AI, from such an IP, sorry, from such an IP-centric point of view, that thinking about you, the criminal aspects, the liability aspects, the tax aspects, all these different things, it does make you realise that We've got to have a good think about what we are getting ourselves into. I think creating, adding a conscience of some description to whatever we do, and as you say, kind of safeguarding it through that route rather than through legislating it out of existence, which will never work anyway, has to be the way forward. As a, uh, we've mentioned sci-fi, and as a, and a major sci-fi fan, uh, I fear the singularity. I gather it's quite a long way up. That you know, when basically in the Terminator Two, in it, no Terminator when you get self-awareness and you start a nuclear war kind of thing. It does worry me a bit that we do need to be aware that this stuff's going to be potentially rather clever than we are. And we do need to make just, sure. Just going to go and get some tin foil, if you excuse me. Actually, what I, one thing I do, and I well, recommend we, to everybody. We, it's funny, you started this off by saying, you know, I think we spend more time talking about what AI is going to do than what it's actually doing. But I think as Willem says, this is why we should be doing it. Because you wouldn't want to wake up in 10 years and have us all working in the Skynet salt mine, right? Or Jeff Bezos' <laughs> salt mine. Although let's be honest, what would they need us to work in a salt mine for? You know, this is kind of the age old question, do we let technology outpace regulation or do it the other way? And, you know, a pro, you know, getting the most social benefit out of AI is going to require a combination of things, but some of that is legislation that protects us against kind of the most egregious risks of AI and helps ensure we have the most benefits. And that is something that we should be talking about now before it is, we're trying to clean things up after the fact. Guys, I'm, I'm conscious that we've been going for just about an hour, which is what, where we normally set ourselves. So I'm, I'm thinking we probably ought to um, try and bring this in. Gwillem knows that my, my stock way of trying to bring this in is just to ask a really stupid question of each of us at the end. Generally something that we've not been briefed on. So here you go, Ryan, you get to start as you're the guest. What, what would you take out of your life today and automate through AI tomorrow? What, what do you want to get rid of? What do you want it to do for you that would improve your life no end? Well, you see, I, I, I'm not sure if this was a profound question. I should give it more reflection. My off-the-cuff one was, as Gwilym was talking about day-long Zoom meetings, I think I'm going to make an avatar of myself for all committee-related meetings to do my Zoom calls for me. I, I tried that. I just did a video recording of myself on Zoom, and sometimes I just put that as my background and walk away, and it, and it just sits there doing this. Oh, so, we like it. We like it when you do that, Lee. In case you're wondering, it goes down really well. What about you, Lee? What's yours? Oh no, you got in quick. Ah, <laughs> I knew I know how this works. Absolute. Oh. Well, actually, it's. I guess it's related. The bane of my life is trying to take a three, three and a half hour SEPA council meeting and make sense of it through the medium of minutes. 
So I would I would love there to be, and you know the way the minutes work, Willem, they're, they're not necessarily a verbatim recollection of everything we talked about. There's some kind of synthesis and there's some kind of intelligence put into that to try and make it make sense in, in the world that we're in and stuff like that. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a blooming difficult job. It takes hours and hours and hours. I would love there to be a program, AI, whatever that might be, that can sit into a SEPA council meeting and chuck out a set of minutes at the end of it that isn't just a transcript but gets the nuance and gets the context and the like that. That Yeah, that would be it for me. You know what, Lee? I'm going to make a futurist prediction here and say, go out on a limb and say, we are going to have an AI that will do that for you. Brilliant. Can I be the first to try it? Yes. That's the best kind of futurism is the futurism you want to hear. I like that. So go on then, Gwilym. I, 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 I'd like to do, obviously it's going to be silly. Um, I'd, love, I'd love just to press a button and my bath filled up to the right temperature. Well, you know, I mean, I've got mixing I think they already have. Oh, it's arrived. The future's here. It's a singular. It's like the bath singularity. The bath <laughs> singularity is here. I don't know if we can put aroma, you know, essential oils in yet, but you know, I think the digital. Well, you know, we've already gone from the uh, the hot and the cold to a single mixer. I think that was a good start, but I, I think I think you've already got digital ones now. I can tell you in America because <laughs> I've just got two taps and you've got to wiggle them and it's never quite right and it's really irritating. You either sc you scream when you get in the bath for one of two reasons. You'll work out what they are. I'm glad, however, the future's arrived in America and as usual, it'll take 10 years for it to get over here. Oh, well, you know, that's Japan, but we did get past <laughs> a few taps. You know, when I first got to England and I experienced this two tap system and it didn't make a lot of sense to me, people said, well, but you know, you can just fill the bowl up, but that's pretty disgusting, especially in a public restroom. So, you know, I, I don't know if, if there is kind of another means of burning or freezing one hand and just kind of going back and forth. Um, I think <laughs> I you should that. go straight to I Japan. I literally wiggle my hand between the taps. Yeah. And has no one realized that 50 years ago, someone came up with a solution to this. But <laughs> you know, my, my recommendation with almost all things AI is circumvent America, go right to Japan, get the okay. bidets, okay. get the digital faucets, and they have robots. They do. They do. Reasonable ones, I hope. Ryan, it's been an absolute delight having you on. You've been a brilliant, brilliant guest. Thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. Um, I can't help but think that um, a little ways down the line, we'll ask you back if that's okay. No, that'd be great. Thanks so much for having me, Lee. It was really yeah. wonderful. Gw Gwilym, it was almost nice having you on. Um, oh, you're I've, such a sweetie. I've, I've, I've got no choice. I'll see you on the next one, mate. Uh, I, I, let's do one from the pub. We actually discussed that. Yeah. Okay, then I'll come up. I'll come up. I'll bring my small microphone with me. Don't walk into a pub. I'll never let you in. Oh, yeah, what is that? <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thank you. Cheers.